Mark here, another great Mark 2.0. We have such a fabulous guest today, Gordon. Uh, if you ever heard of the group Hue and Cry, if you haven't, check them out. Labor of Love, Looking for Linda, Violently, you name it. They have a whole string of singles and really great albums. Greg Kane, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me, man. Well, we are just honored to have, you know, such a icon in pop music and rock uh, industry come on the podcast. We've had so many great guests. Now, let us have you start out by explaining how a hue and cry came about and your uh, history around it. Well, um, Pat and I are both in our mid fifties now. So we, at the end of punk, that would have been what, late seventies where I was 13, 14, Pat was kind of 16, 17. And there was a lots of bands coming out of that post-punk that were trying to kind of figure out what to do next because punk had kind of trashed everything in the UK. Pat and I were big jazz fans, big soul fans, always been Marvin Gaye and Sinatra and Count Basie and Coltrane and, you know, but, you know, punk had such a big um, effect on us, not wholly a positive effect. I, I thought the Sex Busters were too glammy for me, so I'm more kind of aired towards The Clash and kind of early Costello, and then when Joe Jackson appeared, I saw a guy being punky but playing the piano, and I kind of dug that, and I thought, right, okay, but there was nobody kind of doing the kind of jazz soul references that we wanted to do. There was a band called Pig Bag that were kind of doing a little bit of it. But Pat and I just pursued our love of jazz and soul, but with this growing up with punk all around us. So um, that was the late 70s, early 80s, all the way through school. I was in different bands. Pat was more, he loved um, musicals. The school was a very strong music um, uh, department. And Pat was kind of always picked to sing lead because he's such a strong voice. And it wasn't until the end of school when a band I was in, the singer left. I said to the guys, do you want to get my brother in? And they said, well, the guy that sings all the musicals. I said, yep. So we were playing sort of punk jazz at that time. And he came in and he was really good. It really suited um, what he sounded like as a kind of 17-year-old. Um, but the band didn't like... Pat and I started writing songs for them and they didn't like the songs, so they threw us out. Wow. So that was sort of what, early 80s? And then uh, he went to university, I went to university, and the money that we got um, from our grants, we put into making records, making demos, and the demos started to get played because the on the radio because the, the uh, recording studio, Berkeley Street Studios, who were host to... Oh, Orange Juice, Edwin Collins, Local and the Commotions, the Blue Bells, um, when all these sort of early, sort of mid 80s sort of Scottish bands were going through the studio. So the local radio station was always tap into the studio and say, what, who came through this week or who's going through that week? And said, so there's these two young brothers called Hugh and Cry. So we got played on the radio. And then one time we went in to make this demo, we'd saved up £100, which is about $150. And the guy that owned the studio said, you can keep put the money back in your pocket if you let me manage you. So we put our money back in our pocket. We went home, told our father, he said, you didn't sign anything, did you? He said, no, we didn't sign anything. And that guy, Alan, was our manager for the next five years, six years, right up until the early 90s. And he sort of steered us through the, the headiness of becoming pop stars. Wow. So if I can jump in, now you are a... Uh, you're you're a classically trained pianist, as I understand it. From the age of nine, yeah. Yeah, and so from classical piano, and I, you know, uh, I'm thinking Mozart, Chopin, <laughs> Bach, mm -hmm. and, and you're surrounded by the Clash and the Sex Pistols and the punk scene. That that's quite a confluence. It was difficult for me. Um, the whole punk ethos of anybody can pick up a guitar was uh, used to frustrate me because from the age of nine, I had a whole practice regime because I had a quite a strict, strict piano, uh, piano teacher and she would make her feelings known um, if you hadn't practiced. She could tell if you turned up and hadn't practiced. So I had a whole practice regime um, and I understood the whole jazz ethos as well. 
about, you know, there's you have to attain a certain level of virtuosity and then you can either choose to go further or you can scrap it. But you have to know the know before you start to kind of unknow it, if you know what I mean. So I, I, I was a bit frustrated at some of the musicians that I would encounter who could barely play, but that was the punk ethos. So you had to kind of try and fit in or underplay to fit in or not try and fit in. So but so I wanted to fit in because the guys were fun to hang out with and I had to kind of learn to unplay. But what I what I did upon reflection, I started to play lots of other instruments. So um, I played saxophone from the age of 12, played guitar since the age of 10, played bass um, in many different bands. So in a way, rather than kind of getting frustrated at other people's inability to play, I would sort of go and play, start to learn how to play new instruments. And once I learned how to play them, I would move on to another instrument. So I had to fill my time with learning. I'm a bit of a, a geek when it comes to music. Now, what about uh, how many times were you on uh, Top of the Pops? And did that, was that meaningful to you? Because we've had other guests on where they said, I was really, you know, they weren't necessarily disappointed, but they thought, you know, the place would be bigger and that it'd be a, you know, bigger atmosphere, so to speak. Well, the poor audience, I mean, yeah, they were herded in and herded about. There was really only about 50 of them, so they always made it look as though there was a lot busier than it was. But, I mean, these poor 50 souls who had um, um, applied to do this show um, had to avoid huge cameras and cables and were being directed uh, brutally by stage managers. And, yeah, it was quite a... Top of the Pops was a big deal. It was broadcast every Thursday night, peak time, 7 o'clock. And 10, 12, 14 million people, which is, you know, a lot of people in Britain would watch it and they would go out and buy the records. So, I mean, we, um, the story for our first Top of the Pops was Labour Love was released in the summer of 87. Um, and it was about number 34 in the charts. And there was a band called Los Lobos, who had La Bamba, were booked to do the show. And they didn't get their work visas. So the the, the the people that run the show looked down the charts and we were next to them. So that's how we got on. And then there was a talk show host here called Terry Wogan, who was a big show, had a big show called Wogan on a Saturday night. And his wife saw us on Top of the Pops. On, it was filmed two days before it was broadcast Top of the Pops. So she was in the studio and she went home and told her husband, who had sway amongst his producers, and we were booked on his show on the Saturday night. So on the Thursday night, we did the biggest music show. And then two days later, we had the biggest TV talk show in the same week. So what that was it. Yeah, so I remember, I, re I remember jumping around my hotel room when we got the news, we were doing the TV show on the Saturday night. So we stayed in London. We we're in London for a month because people kept booking us for other shows. So I experienced that rush you get when it all starts to kind of connect. But Labour Love had been, uh, been released for about six seven weeks it just kept crawling up the charts it didn't stop but it didn't jump into the charts high it just kept creeping up so in all in all i think it was about 16 20 weeks it was in the charts that summer so it became the sound of the summer that song in 1987 oh, good. you know wogan for wogi as i understand he's sometimes called for those from a north american context that's johnny carson mm -hmm. you know, it was the biggest it was a massive it's, show yeah, Massive. it's the, the equivalent. I was in a play once called The One for the Road with uh, written by um, Willie Russell. Mm. And uh, we actually, I had to research Wogan because there was a scene in the play where we acted out the talk show in someone's living room. It, it was the thing to do mm -hmm. in Britain. Uh, but I wanted to ask you, you're a young man, you're growing up in Glasgow, right? And... No, that's a good attempt. Was, that was a good attempt. Oh, it's not bad. My not grandfather, bad. <laughs> my grandfather was from Glasgow, mm. and it, it's got a bit of a reputation. Uh, Glasgow is thought to be, you know, it's a rough town. That's what people think. Mm -hmm. And you're a young man growing up in Glasgow in the music scene. Glasgow has a reputation being very blue collar, very rough and tumble, and you're a classically trained musician. <laughs> I mean, it, 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 it's a, there's a contrast there, which, yes. and there seems to be a lot of contrast in your life. You're in the punk scene, but you're a jazz aficionado. Jazz, jazz is your love. 
-hmm. So navigating those that period of the late seventies, even into the nineties, must have been <laughs> challenging. It was, but Glasgow in 1990 was the cultural city of Europe. So every year Europe um, appoints a, a city to be the cultural representative of Europe. And what it does is it gives the city um, an opportunity to better itself. So when it's when it's broadcast on the glo on a global stage or European stage, every, all the eyes of Europe are on this city. So Glasgow had some fantastic festivals. Mayfest was a festival that happened in May. Uh, every year in Glasgow, and it brought in a world acts from all over the place. That Glasgow Council put a lot of money in behind it. And also the Glasgow International Jazz Festival is the longest running festival in Glasgow. It's nearly in its 40th year now. And again, it was very well supported financially by the local council. And it wasn't unheard. I mean, I went to see Miles Davis in 1988, came to Glasgow and on his 2 2 tour. So we had the opportunity because of, I don't know who was pulling the strings culturally back then for Glasgow, but as you say, that's a fair description of what the city was like. But if you if you, if you you went looking, you could find a lot of high-end culture in the city. Um, so, I mean, I've, yeah, I've seen the Brecker brothers, I've seen Miles Davis, I've seen Ricky Lee Jones, I've seen Ron Carter, I've seen, in the late 80s, early 90s, coming to the Glasgow International Jazz Festival. It doesn't have that funding now that it had back then, but back then, it was a big festival. Well, I I, I'll, I was at um, talking to a work colleague who's Scottish, David, mm -hmm. and I said to him, ah, "Have you heard of Hugh and Cry?" He goes, "Oh, of course. He's 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 our age." And and the, I said, "I'm born the same year you are. We're mm -hmm. we're, we're both coming up on fifty six. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I and I said, "Are you from Glasgow?" And he goes, "Ah, that's an insult. Don't he say that to me." I'm like, and Glasgow, as you say, while it has that reputation, Glasgow, as you mentioned, is an international city. I think it's because of shipbuilding in the shipyards basically gave it that reputation because when you're working in shipyards, you're not dealing with the creme de la creme of society. You're not dealing with um, classical pianists and saxophonists and jazz aficionados typically when you're working down in the shipyards <laughs> well i would i don't know some our manager at the moment was the youngest shop steward in the shipyards and govern in glasgow these guys are highly skilled i mean you watch what these guys can do from nothing they can create these vast vessels and you know shipyard workers are, are revered in this city um yes they played sure. hard but they also worked hard and they were highly skilled uh, people and um the, the the reputation that glasgow had you know it's still got a bit of that i mean every, every, everywhere has but i mean even the glasgow has the royal conservatoire of music uh, right now and it's um it got to the third most prestigious music school in the world so i think it's sitting about number six and the the the, the head of the jazz department is a saxophonist called tommy smith who we worked with in the late 80s and I think Tommy's got an MBE or an OBE now. He's he's highly regarded, Tommy. But he's turned that course into one of the most sought after. So now in Glasgow, if you want a band, you just go down to the three local jazz clubs and you can watch all these kids who can play. I, I uh, Before COVID, I had about five students that used to come here to my studio and I would teach them piano, but I wasn't. they could play me under the table. And these are kids coming from all over the world my job was to teach them how to communicate with other musicians so my role was teaching them how to read a room as musicians because you got to remember when you get to this stage as a musician your social skills are a little bit you know underwhelming because these kids spend hours every day practicing that's how they get that good so they don't go out you know and when they play in an ensemble you you watch these kids and they all overplay you're like whoa 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 stop and then my job was to teach them so that, but when I was doing that for years, the standard kept getting higher and higher and higher. And a lot of the piano teachers that were at the conservatory in Glasgow, they used to say to me, we are having to put such a shift in to practice, to meet these kids. Because these kids are coming from a YouTube. That's where they learn. We didn't have YouTube. I had a record player that had a, a 16, 33, 45, and 78. So you'd 78. Put, you'd used to put the thing on at 16, work out what key it was in, and you'd practice Charlie Parker heads at 16 revolutions per minute 
um, and that would be down a fifth. And you need to kind of work out when you sped it up again, you know, you had to go 1645, 1633, 45, and then 78 to where it actually was. And, you know, that's how that's how I learned. Uh, but the kids now have got access to so much information. The level that they come to these uh, colleges, music colleges, that is so high. So Glasgow has benefited from this conservatoire. So when Pat and I need to put a band together, I'll go out for a month. I say to my partner, I'm going out again tonight. Again? Yeah, I'm just going on a wee scouting mission to see who's out there. And you can pick a band within two or three weeks and get them together and go and do some gigs with them, some festivals, and then they come back and go back to the college again. The standard is so high now. And a lot of the bands, a lot of these kids, Scottish kids say, it was my parents listening to Hugh and Cry and listening to the, the Brecker Brothers on Hugh and Cry Records, listening to Ron Carter on Hugh and Cry Records, listening to the Tower Power of Horns. You know, that's, they said, that's what Andy Newmark, Dennis Chambers, all these guys that we used when we were making our records, that's what influenced them. So Pat and I feel as though we've contributed quite a lot to what the state of Glasgow music scene right now. Let me ask you something. I wanted to ask what it's like to be able to work with your brother all these years, because you see all these bands that are no longer together. Prime example, I went to uh, the concert last night, Mid Jury and Howard Jones, and who's playing for Howard Jones is Nick Beggs. And they were jokingly, you know, they, they come on to sing uh, Too Shy, which was a Kajagugu song. And Howard Jones is like, due to the rights, you know, due to licensing and everything, we are not allowed to play this song. And jokingly, you know, because of, uh, you know, Kajagugu breaking up and all that, you know. Yeah. Uh, but what is it like for you to be able to work with your brother all these years? And how did the name Hue and Cry come about? How did you decide on that name? Well, I remember... Pat came, we, we did lots of, the first band was the Winning Losers, then the next band was Unity Express, which is still Pat and I, and then the names didn't sit well with us, and then I remember Pat coming home from uni one day and said, I thought about Hue and Cry, and I said, well, I've never heard of Hue and Cry before, and he says, well, it means a loud public commotion that's usually used, there will be a Hue and Cry if such and such happens in a kind of political arena. And he says, it works with the duality of us. You know, you're the Hugh, the background, and I'm the Cry, the singer. And I said, okay, let's run with that. So there was no other bands called Hugh and Cry. So we ran with that. So Pat's um, uh, the wordy one here. My job when he writes lyrics is to edit them because he always gives me too many. So he's, I'm thinking, I'm, I feel sorry for the editors of the newspapers and, and book publishers that he works with because he's very difficult to edit. You've got to be, you've got to be very careful because every word that he comes up with is obviously precious to him. And with regards to working with your brother, I sometimes sit with my friends and they complain about their siblings and they complain about their families and they see them at Christmas, they see them at weddings, they see them at funerals. And I said, well, I see my brother, we do 50 gigs a year plus, and I see him most weekends, I'm with my brother. And they say, how on earth do you do that? And I said, well, we really only communicate on the stage. We don't do, we don't hang out. We don't go for dinner. We don't do breakfast. We don't, all we do is go on the stage and we have and two hours of intimacy that most siblings don't get the chance to do. So we don't really rehearse that much. We'll talk about the gigs we're going to do and the songs we want to play. We'll rehearse on our own. If anything comes up, you know, we can talk phone and talk to each other. But when we walk on stage, um, that's the first we've kind of seen each other for the week and we like to keep it that way because we can communicate now when we're on stage and um, we're very open with the audience. We'll have a conversation with each other. If there's something that's bothering us, we'll have a, a, a conversation in front of the audience and they can enjoy that or they can't enjoy it. Or So it, when you come and see two brothers perform, you're getting a lot of conversation between two brothers and you're getting a lot of intimacy between two brothers. And I think we've just managed to manage a relationship to a point where there's really no conflict anymore. I mean, there's some little kind of idiosyncrasies. When we book into a hotel, uh, we say to the hotel, can you make sure that the rooms are furthest apart you've got? And that's usually met with a laugh. And you say, well, the reason being is Pat listens to his TV way too loud for me. And before a gig, I like to sleep before a gig and he likes to rehearse. So some poor businessman down the hall can deal with that. I don't want to have to deal with that. So there's certain things that we, we don't eat together. We don't stay in rooms next to each other in hotels. Um, and 
as I say, we get very intimate with each other on the stage and it can be very emotional at times. Most of the times it's quite emotional. So we don't deal with that after the gig. We just kind of walk away from it. So I think we've got these ground rules that work for us. And um, these, these bands that have got siblings, um, obviously they don't have those ground rules. I was doing a review. I do. I write for a magazine here called The West Ender. And I was doing a review of Hame, the, 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 the girl three piece, the kind of girl punk band. American punk band and that's three sisters I can't imagine I've got another brother a younger brother I can't imagine the three of us in one band that's just too much I couldn't do that but they seem to make it work so they must have mechanisms the same as us that you, you don't do certain things I just can't eat with Pat because when you well you if he finishes you eat so fast so when he finishes all he does is stare at your plate if you're halfway through your dinner that's all he does and he doesn't see a problem with it but it's a real problem for me. So we never eat. It's quite frustrating for our partners because they say, like, can the four of us go out for dinner if you guys are in London? No. Why not? <laughs> we don't eat together. So well, it's very, very strange for people that you'll never see Pat and I at the same table. Uh, you know, sibling rivalry comes out. You know, everyone knows about sibling rivalry. But I would imagine your d description of Pat Mm. So, you know, you seem to be such totally diametrically different personalities. From the same womb, yeah. Yeah, uh, that I would imagine, I don't know, I, I cannot honestly think, yes, I can think of lots of uh, bands, multi-member bands, where there are a couple are siblings. Mm -hmm. But I, 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 is there another group out there like Human Cry where it's a duo? And both brothers? That you proclaimers, I guess. The, the Proclaimers are twin brothers. That's a different yeah, that's, yeah, that's right. Um, yeah. Um, I'm trying to think. No, that's a bit only. And the Proclaimers are quite a strange connection for us because her mother was a midwife. So she was a nurse. So she, her focus was on her patients and her people that she was looking after, not so much on her family. So we were taught to be resilient from a very young age. And the Proclaimers have got a very similar memory of their mother because she was a midwife. And as it's transpired, our younger brother has been playing bass with the Proclaimers for the last 15 years. So there's a, there's a, there's a strong connection between the Proclaimers and Tune Cry. Uh, but that's the only other band I can think of that's siblings. Um, but um, I wouldn't change, I, I can't give any advice on families. Again, when I'm socialising with my friends and they're complaining about their families and they maybe look to you because you have a strong relationship with your brother and you say, well, I can't give you any advice because our relationship is completely the, not the norm of right. any relationship. I mean, I'm thinking about, um, I mean, the stereotype image is the classic um, Italian family run business, be it in a restaurant or whatever, you know, they must be able to deal with all the stuff that comes in. But Pat and I are not rivals. We've never, we've, we've got very defined roles. Pat's a very big picture person. He can step back and look at the big picture of what's going on. And he's very good at that. He's not trained in music in any way whatsoever. So for me as a trained musician, and I'm involved in a minutiae of what's going on in a recording or what's going on in an arrangement, I'm very lucky to have him because he doesn't care about all that. He just cares about how it sounds as you step back. And sometimes it's difficult for me to step back. So I rely on him quite a lot to kind of overview what we're doing. And he can be quite brutal sometimes, my brother, but I need him to be like that. So we've got very defined roles. So there's, there's very little rivalry between us now. I don't see him as a threat and hopefully he doesn't see me as a threat. Well, obviously not. You're symbiotic, everything works. He he, mm -hmm. he, front, he does the singing, You're, but it, have you ever wanted to step behind the piano and be more the face of the duo or, or are you more are you more comfortable on the music side as opposed to the um, vocal side. If you come and see Hugh and Cry live, uh, there's multiple opportunities where he gives me the mic and yes. I can either decide to sing or I can reflect on something that's happened in the day or what was the last, it doesn't, it doesn't, it's not rehearsed when he asks me to do this. So sometimes he'll just maybe want a break from singing or the fourth or fifth song and say, I know a word from my brother and he'll just throw it like that. And then the last times that he's done it, I've, I've kind of caught me on the hop a bit and I've just said, what do you want to know about Pat? Just to throw it back at him. And then they <laughs> start putting their hands up 
and they start asking questions about him. And a few times he's spit his tea out. But I mean, he's just throwing. But I mean, we don't. It's not rehearsed. We don't. There's no. There's no venom. There's no. Uh, I just. I started doing that, and it's become really popular now. So. <laughs> he kind of he kind of waits a bit now before he says I know a word from my brother because he knows he doesn't know what he's going to get so I mean it can be anything from I'll usually ask the audience do you want to know anything is there any questions you want to ask because post COVID the gigs have been great I mean amazing the gigs that we've yes. done but the thing that we don't do is we don't go and meet the audience now which was always a big part of what Hue and Cry live experiences are because as you say we've been doing this for 35 years plus so in this audience, the audience that come to see you, they've had 35 years as well. And they're dying to tell you about what's happened in their life and how your music has time stamped these events in their life. So those conversations can be very emotional and very um, heartfelt uh, and very entertaining and funny as well. I mean, we get everything. The last time before COVID, these three guys came up and they had an urn full of ashes. And it was a, a brother that was the biggest Hue and Cry fan, and they brought the ashes to the gig. And they brought the ashes to the, the merch stand, and Pat and I were like, what do we do? And they said, could you please just sign that they earn? And we said, okay, then. And then there was another thing, these three uh, relations, three guys, four guys cornered me and my front house guy, and the oldest one said, uh, you know, we don't like you. We don't, we're not really big Hue and Cry fans. I'm like, okay, thank you. I've just come off stage. But they, they said, but our cousin who loved you brought us to one of your gigs and we like rock music. So we just went there for him and he loved you. And then when he passed, every year we come and see you at least once in his memory. So we all went for a drink in London and we got a wee bit drunk and they recalled some of the places they've been and <laughs> they really don't like you and Kai. <laughs> 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 oh, oh, oh. So there's lots, of, that's the thing that I miss, is these interactions after the shows. As I said, because we're all a bit older and all the kind of fans of um, hysteria, it's, it's not that it's gone away, but it's a different relationship you have with people that like your music now. It's a more adult relationship, and as I said, it can it can, it can get quite emotional hanging out with the fans. So, haven't done that for a, few, a little while. So, I guess how that's how this um, impromptu Q and A session has started during the gigs. So at least they still get to ask their questions and tell their stories. So, um, that's been a development uh, post COVID that I've quite enjoyed. So, yeah, nice. One thing that uh, stood out to me is even though that you can't interact with them. I've noticed a lot of uh, fans writing meaningful comments on your YouTube videos. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, looking for Linda. And one thing I wanted to ask is all these groups, they have songs about women, you know, Toto, Pamela, Starship Sarah. Was there an actual Linda that Looking for Linda was about? It's quite, it's quite a dark song, Looking for Linda. I mean, Pat, uh, he's a very good lyricist and a lot of the lyrics that I get presented with initially can be quite dark and quite, you know, uh, involved in many, many layers. And my job within Hue and Cry is to try and put them in an environment where people would listen to them because, you know, um, the thing about Looking for Linda, it's a serious song about a, a woman trying to escape a, a very horrible domestic situation. So when he's first sang the lyric to me, it was a, quite a dark lyric. And then when I started playing the chord progressions, he was quite frustrated because he knew that I was lightening the lightening the, the, the shade a bit. I was trying to bring it up to sort of, you can still sing about Linda and her the struggles that she has, but it's such a great lyric. It would be a shame it was buried in some dark corner of a Hugh and Cry album. So that was one of the classic tussles between two songwriters where he's, he's fully aware of what I'm trying to do and he can resist it. Um, but when we got to the place where I got him to sing Never Stop Looking, Never Stop Looking for Linda repeatedly, to get him to repeat that was the hardest, one of the hardest things I've ever done. But when he realised what I was trying to do, I think, it, it, yes, he kind of came round to my way of thinking was, this is such a great lyric. It's a shame that it wouldn't be heard. So I'm just trying to give it a vehicle that's a bit more accessible. You don't have to compromise on the lyric. There was... There was a few expletives in that song. I remember when he was singing it in New York, he kept singing the word bastard, if you don't mind me swearing. And the two producers just looked at me and went, how are we going to get him to stop singing that word? I said, well, 
I've been trying to get him to stop singing that word for the last three months since we wrote the song. So I don't know what you're going to do. So one of the producers went in and had a long conversation with him and said, well, this song's not going to get played if you keep singing this word. So you'll need to rewrite it. And he was he resisted. So he can be quite difficult. Pat. He, that word needed to be there for him. So, um, you know, I don't know about all these other songs about females that you've mentioned, but Looking for Linda was, that was the struggle with the song. And I remember when it came out, it was when we finished the album in New York and there was a guy called Bobby Douglas who played bass with Stevie Wonder who was playing bass on some of the record and he was dancing around singing Never Stop Looking, Never Stop Looking for Linda and I watched him at the after show, at the, at the album rap party and he said, oh man, that's such a great record and he kept dancing around, dancing around. I remember watching him going, God, there might be something here and then when it was released and it did really, really well for us, yeah, Pat never sang that swear word again, although sometimes he does sing it live and then he explains to the audience why he did it. And then he points a finger at me saying, you just stop me from singing that word. I'm like, sorry. Well, I'll, I'll, you're, you're, you know, you're talking about attention here. There are two elements often to, I would imagine, non, you know, I, I, I can't carry a note in a, in a suitcase and I don't play any instruments, but you have one aspect, like I'm, I'm listening to you talk about your love of jazz and all the instruments you play and you have an idea in your mind of you know what you like but then there mm -hmm. has to be another element that says well wait a minute that's not going to sell i like it but the mm -hmm. but the market the producers the record industry they're going to want this sound and there's a tension there when you're writing music how much, I'd love to hear you talk about that. How, how much do you have to compromise what, you know, what Greg Kane wants in the song versus what you perceive up the market wants, the producers want, the record companies want? I think you have to give your music a chance. I mean, I, I fully um, sign up to the belief that you make the music you make and then music tastes are kind of cyclical so eventually it'll come back around and you just get lucky it comes back around you know um there's a lot of people who chase it and you're never going to get there because you're never ahead of the trends you can't be you have to just do what you do and hope that it comes around and pat and i touch would have been lucky that it's happened a few times to us but you have to give the music a chance there's um pardon me you can make music for different environments um, the music that we write, the songs can be played just for the two of us sitting at a piano. We can play any of our songs. Um, and that's the acid test for us, because that means we can sit in a bar or a theater or wherever, and we can just sit and play these songs, no matter which song from whatever album, from whatever era you pick. And even recently, um, we've just finished writing songs for, a, believe it or not, an electronic dance record that Pat has been wanting to make for years. And he made me learn how to work all these synths and I learned how to work them. And no song is under 125 beats per minute. So they're all up there. I know, man of my age, how dare I? Um, <laughs> <laughs> but his voice suits it. And when you write to that, um, that brief, you kind of go, right, you write in a different way. But um, I was struggling a bit with the record uh, and I didn't know what to do with it. And I sat one week and I played them all just in the piano. I've got a nice piano here. And they all worked. And I recorded me playing them and I sent them to Pat. Um, he lives in London. And he kind of phoned me and said, shit, they all work. I says, I know they shouldn't, but they do. But then I'm a big Vince Clark fan. And Vince Clark, he writes all his music on guitar. He just sits and plays them. And a big Gary Newman fan as well. During COVID and the lockdown, I watched Gary Newman just sit and play the guitar. You wouldn't think. So that's what, the, 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 even the songs that they write, electronica, they have to work just simply with the guitar. So, I mean, um, yes, I need to get this record finished, but they all, all the songs work like that, all the songs that Pat and I write, and um, that's the, we, we don't write by, um, what's the word, proxy, we don't write by... In, by formulaic. Uh, formulaic, we don't have a formula. It has right. to, it has, I have to give the songs a chance if you write them like this electronic music um, will work on a dance stage and it'll work on just the two of us. Um, but the, there's more to do with the melody and the arrangement, the harmonic arrangement. I kind of know what works. I listen to a lot of um, mainstream media, be it radio or TV, and I, 
as I said before I came on here, I was sitting watching Kendrick Lamar last night playing in Glastonbury. And my partner, she went to bed. She shook her head. She said, I don't understand this. I said, well, I'm going to persevere and figure out what's going on here. So I like studying music and figuring out what's what's connecting and, and trying to understand why it connects. I don't even um, hope to have any sort of formula that I could give people that this is what you have to do. You're just going to put your music in an environment and give it the best chance it can possibly have of connecting. And people do it different ways. That's why bands are all different. There is no right way of doing it. But within our confines and within our ability as musicians, my job is to try and give it that chance. And that's what happened with the song Looking for Linda. We're trying to steer Pat into a place that he could, one, get the emotion of his lyric across, get the lyric across, but also don't, don't be on there with people enjoying singing, never stop looking for Linda, never stop looking for Linda. That's all part of the experience. Well, um, you talked about how the cyclical nature and how, well, if it's not hot right now, just wait another two, five, ten years, it'll come back around. Mm -hmm. And speaking of come back around, uh, let's talk about it. Hit me, baby, one more time. Oh, yeah. Uh, do you have anything good to say about Shaken Stevens? <laughs> Shaky. Um, he was very aloof. When people are aloof, you don't know whether they're a bit dumb or they're just aloof. You ever know, or they're a wee bit, you don't know. He was very aloof. Um, but that TV show, there was a whole spate of these shows um, that they would try and bring people out of retirement and put them back on the stage. And it was very kind of voyeuristic. It was, the, I think what they wanted was the audience to kind of go, oh, look at the state of them now, or they can't sing, or they can't, <laughs> you know, that, that was a very big thing about these shows. But Pat contacted me, said, I want to go on Saturday Night TV again, Greg, it was 2006. And I said, oh, Pat, I'm, I, I need to lose some weight, and I need to do this, I need to do that. He said, well, come on, please. I said, okay. So I said, I'm not, we used to, back in the day, they used to give you a three-week notice for a photo session, so you had three weeks to shed stone and a half, two stone, because you wouldn't be looking after yourself. So I found these old diets that I used to do and held my nose and off I went and stabbed myself to death for three weeks for the photo session or for the TV show. So I did it again and um, lo and behold, we won our heat. And then I remember all the hysteria around that. Um, and then we did the final show and we came second to Shaking Stevens. But after all that, it was a young production team. So when I first spoke to them, I said, can I make the music? I don't want any like musical director. Or, I don't mind using bands. I quite like using lots of other bands because that's how you get to meet musicians. And they said, fine, you make the music. So we did a version of Beyonce's Crazy in Love, but more based on the Shy Lights version of, you know, Are You My Women? Because we were, um, we, I was aware of that track when I first heard Beyonce's Crazy in Love. I said, oh, that's that track from the, the She Lights who were putting some Shy Lights. So, we made it more towards that and they loved it and it did really well. And um, But most importantly, at the end of the whole show, um, we had a meeting with the producers and they said, do you need anything from us? And my brother was great. He says, we want the data. How many people voted for us? And they said, 160,000 people voted for him. And so how do we get that data? How do we get their phone numbers? And this is all pre-Facebook. This is all pre-social pre media. And they said, well, yes. we can't divulge that data, but at least you know there's 160,000 people around a country that want to see or would physically pick up the phone and vote for you. So we went about gathering information. We went to old promoters, old venues that we played, and they'd kept did databases of addresses, email addresses. Mostly it was phone numbers and addresses. And we gathered all this data. It took us a year to gather all the data, as much as we could. And then we launched our own social media site called the Hugh and Cry Music Club. And it just built and built and built and built. And we worked so hard and people didn't know what we're doing. So why, what are you going to do with all this information? But Pat's a big techie. So he realized that we built a walled garden on the internet and you only can come in here if you like Hugh and Cry. That's, and if you don't like Hugh and Cry, you can go, you don't have to come in. As soon as you misbehave on the forum and stuff like that, you get thrown out. So it's just a safe place for Hugh and Cry basically to tell stories about their relationship with Hugh and Cry throughout the decades and to show old bits of memorabilia, tickets or old recordings or photographs and stuff. And we built this thing up and eventually we transported it onto Facebook and to Instagram and they became more prevalent. But we worked so hard and we did it. There was no paywall. 
because Sting and Prince were doing these paywalls of $120 or $150 a year. We weren't doing that. So you, you there was a lot of the, the new model of you, you seem to be working for nothing an awful lot of the time. But we were prepared to do that and we worked so hard. And that's what's got us to the stage now where we've got a really healthy social media scene and we've got, you know, there was the whole thing about all you need is a thousand fans to spend a hundred dollars a year and you have a career. Whereas before, Labour Love sold 350,000 copies and, you know, you had to sell that amount. You don't need that anymore. So Pat and I do what they call super serve your super fans. So we've got a dedicated bunch, there's about 22,000 now that will buy a t-shirt, come and see a gig or buy a CD, they still like CDs, so. You got, you know, if you, you know, when you're looking at it from a business model perspective, if you have 130,000 people, you don't need to hit them up to join, a, you know, put them behind a paywall. These are the people who are buying your T-shirts, buying your albums, going to your concerts. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we, we we understood the model very very early on, and that's a lot to do with my brother Pat. He he was on top of the whole thing. Um, from a very, I mean, there's a song on our second album called "The Only Thing More Powerful Than Boss." And the lyric he sings is, there's a new computer religion going down right here. And that was in 1988. Wow. He, yeah, he'd seen what was going to happen. And um, well, we, we came through with it. And uh, and the, the amount of, when people started to invest in shooting crime, I'm talking about, we've got a business partner who invested a chunk of money to get it going again or, or take it to another level. And lots of promoters got on board because they realized that Pat and I had done the legwork for years before Facebook became so prevalent. We'd seen it coming um, and we didn't charge for it. And that was the frustrating thing for a lot of people. They couldn't understand where the value was. And yeah, eventually they get not, it out. It's, it's not immediate. It's not no. immediate. You're not getting, but as I say, these are the people buying your t-shirt and they, now they're even more engaged. They mm. feel like they're members of the inner circle in a fashion. Cyberly. But I mean, we, but, we, we, uh, and then eventually with our business partner, Doogie, we, we, when we make a record, um, we make a thousand deluxe versions of the record. So there's either the vinyl, there's a CD, there's lots of paraphernalia, there's DVDs on the making of the record, there's one off bespoke bits of memorabilia about the record, and we package it in this beautiful way. And we sell it at a premium. It's like 40 pounds or like 50 pounds. And we make a thousand of them and we take a year to sell them, but that returns, you know, 50,000 pounds. And the people can go on Spotify and play the record and do what they want. We don't care, but you can enjoy the record. But when they come to see us, it's a memento of the gig or they want a memento, memento for a friend that loves you and cry. And that's a bit of our business model. So we don't need to sell tens of thousands. I mean, it's quite interesting. A friend of mine, Stuart Braithwaite, who sings with the band uh, Mogwai or plays guitar with the band Mogwai, but he sang for the first time his last record and it went to number, number one in the UK. And I said to Stuart, I said, Stuart, if you don't mind me asking, how many records did you sell to get to number one? This is about six months ago. And he said, 19,000 records, Greg. And I said, right. Said, the Labour Love sold 350,000 and it got to number six. So, don't, you know, that's the kind of numbers that people are talking about. Now. So we make deluxe versions of our albums that the fans all love to buy. And that's where our profit is on the record. And then we also do bespoke, the called song frame. So fans can pick a song. Pat and I, he'll write the lyrics, handwrite the lyrics, I'll handwrite the music. We'll make a, a seven inch vinyl of the song because there's companies that will make seven inch vinyl for Wurlitzer machines, like the, uh, what do we call them? You put this coin in the slot and they play the, the any song. The record. Oh, jukebox. Jukebox. So they'll make seven inch singles. So we put it in a big frame, handwritten lyrics, handwritten music, and the single in the middle, and we charge, you know, two hundred dollars for that, and we must do about a hundred, hundred and fifty a year, uh, and they love it. So you you can a super save your super fans uh, with high end product, and you build that as a part of your money making part of your business model, and then you don't get frustrated doing lots of stuff for nothing. What is it like? What is it like for you uh, with the festival scenes? Explain to the people over here in the states. Uh, what the UK, the European festivals are like and who you're playing with, some of the... Well, we've, the festivals are amazing. The last one we did, we played with Adamant, Go West, The Christians, oh, yeah. uh, Ali from UB40, um, Banorama, 
who were absolutely brilliant, actually. Um, and there's 25,000 people in a field and you get treated really well. Um, the production is of the highest quality. It's on a par with Glastonbury, the stage and the production and the PA. And it's a huge thing for us because a lot of the bands turned their nose up at these festivals. But Pat and I, when we got first asked to do them, it was playing in front of all those people again. So you get to play your music in front of all those people. Um, and it's an, it's an immediate hit. You get a huge social media hit from it. Again, there's lots of meet and greets events at these uh, festivals. And Pat and I love them. I mean, they're hard going. It's a long day. Um, and, you know, festivals are quite tiring to go to and to be at and to function at. But the people that run these festivals like Rewind and Let's Rock and there's, there's a multitude of them now. Party at the Palace, we're doing somebody's convinced or persuaded all the palaces around uh, England and some in Scotland that they can put on big events. So they're called Party at the Palace. So these old rich dudes that have got these huge palaces scattered all over the country get 25,000 people descending on their land for a weekend and all these bands playing. So they're great. If you get the chance to come to the UK, come to one of these festivals, you'll love it. It's really brilliant. Well, I, I uh, want to throw in, we talked about Glasgow, so I want to get a Canadian connection going in and there's obviously there's a huge connection between Scotland and Canada. Mm -hmm. um, so many, at one time Gaelic was the most commonly spoken second language in English Canada. Mm -hmm. uh, and we have uh, Canada's home to Glass Tiger, Alan Frew, who is actually from Coatbridge. I was curious mm -hmm. as to whether you've ever met the man. Oh, I met him years ago. Um... God, Glass Tiger, you've sprung that one on me. Um, yeah, there was, <laughs> thing, there was um, the area where Cote Bridge, that's the town where Pat and I were brought up. I was born in Glasgow. We were born in Glasgow. We were brought up in a town called Cote Bridge, and it's in a place called the Monklands. So from the name suggests, it's an old monk town. Um, but um, there was something when I grew up, there was something called the Monklands Musicians Club, there's a bunch of musicians that got together in a pub once a week and they just set up a back line and whoever came, open stage sort of thing. But I was only 15, so that would have been, what, 1981? Yeah, 1981. And we would all get up and play. And I met him at one of those events. And I remember oh, really? that everybody kind of revered him a bit. Um, I didn't know who he was. And he was very kind to me. I was playing saxophone at the time and I can't remember what song I played. It might have been Baker Street or I'm trying to think whatever one, there was a sax solo and a rock song that I always had to play all the time, can't remember. And um, he introduced me to a band called Fast Licks, who had Stevie Doherty was singing with them. So there was a whole kind of rock side to that whole Monkey's Musicians Club. So I met him then, but I must have been 15, 16. So that's the only time that I've Well, he's, him. yeah, he's 10 years older than you and I. And so he, he'd be about 65, 66, mm -hmm. somewhere around there. And uh, he moved to Canada when he was a teenager. He was 14, mm -hmm. 15, 16. And he moved well, he must have been back visiting people at home then that time that I met him. Yeah. yeah. That makes sense. Because he was quite, I remember, he was quite glamorous. I mean, there was something different about him. So he, he had probably spent 10 years away, North, yeah, North America, Canada. Yeah. 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 Well, done well. well the, the thing is, uh, did you notice his accent? Was it a little Canadianized? Because they used to, yeah. Glaswegians can uh, can be tough to understand. You you, yeah. ha you have to soften your accent yeah. to to be understandable to the masses. And uh -huh. I'm sure some are listening right now. And they're like, what did he say? I didn't get it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The the guy I spoke about, Tommy Smith, the saxophone player, who's the dean of jazz at the Royal Conservatoire in Glasgow. He went first went to Berkeley uh, School of Music in Boston when he was 17, 16, 17. I'm Tommy from Dalkeith, which is pure urban Welsh train spotting. You will never understand anything those guys say. <laughs> and when he came back, he sounded like a, an American talk show host. And he got, he got such a hard time from everybody. And I said, no, whoa, whoa, whoa. The only way he probably could have been understood is if he had to adopt this accent. You know, eventually, I lived in New York for about 18 months, sort of in the late 80s, early 90s. And I came home, and the only one that I, the only word that, that I picked up that I got a hard time about, he was, I used to say 13, 13. 
30, because he couldn't understand 13. I remember that, 13. What? 13, 13, which sounds a bit Irish. But um, yeah, you've got to temper your accent if you come from Scotland when you go abroad. Sometimes in England as well. I can go to a shop in England and they just look at me, think, no, didn't get that. They think you're German. <laughs> oh, there's a great video. I don't know if you've seen it. It's uh, I, It's got to be BBC and it has two Scottish lads going into the elevator and it's voice activation. And I would invite our viewers, just voice activated elevator. And they're trying to get the, uh, they, they don't speak Scottish. It won't understand, and they can't get off the darn elevator. Uh, but good on the the, the 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 Apple uh, iPhone engineers have obviously dealt with this. So when you when you re, when you install your new software on your phone, you can teach Siri your accent. I quite like that. Now this is a new thing. Over the last year, it, it, it tells you to say certain phrases. About six phrases that it asks you to say, and it doesn't matter what accent you put, it'll it'll kind of identify your accent on your phone. So that's a recent thing in the last year. So they must have run into those problems so many times. They've managed to solve it. Well, I, I wanted to ask a, another quick question about uh, you contributed to, an, you, you and your brother contributed to an album which benefits uh, something called Radio Clyde Cash for Kids. Mm -hmm. And this is very something very specific to Glasgow. So if you could just talk why it's important to you and what it's about. Well, the Cash for Kids charity um, has been going in Glasgow for a long time, 20, 30 years, probably. And Radio Clyde um, is a big local radio station, the FM radio station in Glasgow. That was the, when I spoke earlier about Pat and I's first recordings made at that recording studio, the, the radio show that played these demo tapes by all the young up and coming bands like Hugh and Cry and Delamitri and, and Wet Wet Wet, Texas and the Proclaimers and blah, blah, blah. It was on this radio station, Radio Clyde. To Radio Clyde were very supportive of young bands back then, but also some more supportive of the local community. So Cash for Kids, the Radio Clyde charity Cash for Kids, um, was a way of raising money for kids and families that needed a bit of help. Um, and you, when you got the phone call, you would leap at the chance to work with them because um, very, very uh, forward-thinking, forward-looking managing directors of this radio station, especially a guy called Paul Cooney. If anybody watched this, they'll know who Paul is. So when Paul would lift up the phone, you would say yes, when and where, you know, without even hesitation because of the work that they did. And Paul managed to bring on board some very wealthy people from Scotland and whatever money that um, Radio Clyde would raise on its own, they would match it. So it became this huge thing. And Paul knew that uh, the more bands that he got involved that were at a certain stage, of their career, the more sway you would have with getting more money. So the whole thing was all about raising money for these families that needed it. And it's still going strong 35 years on and he still manages to get these rich guys to match fund it. So we do our bit, help him raise as much money as he can and then kind of emotionally blackmail these rich guys to match fund it. So it's <laughs> a, very a very important charity in Glasgow Cash for Kids. Well, one thing I wanted to ask that we didn't touch upon, what was it like to work in the music video era, did you enjoy and did you enjoy doing music videos? <laughs> uh, music videos, I saw them as a horrible waste of money, but but I was wrong. It was frustrating. Um, I remember the, the doing all those videos in the eighties. We used to come to the end of your accounts year with the record companies, and you would go through all the money you spent, and you'd realize how much money you'd spent on videos. You maybe did six videos, and you're in three quarters of a million quid and you'd be thinking oh for all the times that video was shown what could we have done with that money think of the good we could have done think of the music we could have made but they were necessary in their time i mean the, the video for labor of love was banned i mean i couldn't believe we went spent all this money in this video and it was banned and I, so they can't show it no why because you're covering yourself in plaster of paris and it's a bit dangerous for kids to watch this because they might start pouring plaster of Paris on each other. So why didn't you think of that when you made the bloody video? But it's supposed to show bondage. I know we can have show bondage in a different way. Anyway, so there was a lot of there was a lot of creatives, flaky creatives, as I called them, making promo videos back then. And we made some incredible videos. I just, but the expense still st sticks in my throat. 
Do, do you look back at, 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 <laughs> at some of these videos and just wonder, because we all remember our age, you remember the 80s videos. What, what did you just say? Uh, you just used a turn of phrase I hadn't heard before. Um, art, phony or you know artsy fartsy artistic yes I, um, I, the flakies they call them the flaky artistics that are a wee bit yeah flaky artistics and yeah. do you ever just look back at these videos and go what were we think i look back at some of these videos hungry for the wolf mm. you know uh eurythmics with the cow and going you know <laughs> yeah that was I mean, there was a lot of people convincing record companies to spend huge amounts of money. I mean, it's different now. I mean, I'm involved a lot in video editing now, and it's, it's you know, all you need to do is spend a chunk of money on an Apple MacBook Pro, and you can make any videos you want, post-production, whatever. But back then, they were dealing with film, and they were dealing with a lot of other stuff. I mean, I'm being a wee bit kind of flippant about the expense of it all, but that's what it costs to make movies. I mean, I've got a friend who's a film an actor and a filmmaker, a guy called Peter Mullen. He's a Scots um, actor. You can Google him. He's a very, very famous Scottish actor over here. He made a film called Ned's, which was a big, a big movie over here. And I, I hope he doesn't mind me saying this, but he raised, um, I think it was 12 million pounds it took to make the movie. And I said, well, Peter, you know, you made the movie. So, I mean, when do you get paid? And he's like, what do you mean? I said, well, if, if I make a project, I'm the last to get paid. If I'm putting up the money, he's just, Oh no no! I'm the first to get paid. This what do you mean? He says, "Well, out of that money, I take my my eight hundred thousand pounds, put it in my back pocket, and then we start filming." Like what? He says, "Oh yeah, that's the way it works in, in the film industry." So that's what was happening back then. They would agree these budgets, these videos, and the video makers would put the money, stick it in their back pocket, and go right. Let's start filming. So there was no risk for them. So they were doing whatever they wanted. You're talking about cows and and yachts, and we we flew to Los Angeles to to film a video. And there was no outdoor shot. It could have been anywhere. It could have been a shed in Glasgow. There was no outside reference to Los Angeles. And they flew us over. Were there for four days and flew us back. And, I, and, I, and it transpired that the guy that was directing the video had meetings in Los Angeles and they found out a way that he could... Anyway, uh, uh, don't talk to him about videos. <laughs> All right. It's great, you know, you're pushing the stereotype because you're always talking, Sc the, the Scots, Ach, I'm Arcani. not paying that. I'm not paying oh. that. Ach, don't you say that to me. I, I I mean, look, what, are, we, are we prudent? No, I mean, I don't. Yeah, that's I'm, it. I'm we're spend, prudent. We're, I mean, I'll spend prudent. money, on, I'll spend money on, on something of quality. I mean, I'm looking at my studio yeah. here. I've got Moog synths. I've got beautiful Gibson guitars. And Do you need a Gibson guitar and a Moog synth? No, you don't. You can do it with other guitars, and so I don't mind. I don't mind paying for something of quality. It's just when you realise that people are kind of there's other agendas afloat here, and you know, what do you say? Do you say it's something and it doesn't happen, or do you keep stum and let it happen and try and make the best of it? I'm going to give you a Scottish joke. Uh, stop me if you've heard it. Well, mm -hmm. let me finish anyway because others won't have heard it, but. Uh, a Scotsman is in Israel in the Holy Land and he, there's a boat tour that'll take you out on the Sea of Galilee and it costs uh, 200 euros. And the, the Glaswegian goes, ah, what, you want 200 euros to go on a boat? Forget it. And the tour guide says, this isn't just any body of water. This is the Sea of Galilee. Jesus walked on this water. And the Glaswegian says, ah, for two hundred, for two hundred dollars, I'd walk too. The <laughs> doom uh, she. <laughs> no, we we might be. Um, yeah, the stereotype might be that we're tight. <laughs> but uh, no, I can be very generous. I must admit. But um, well, yes, we like I'm value. Just... Put it this way: we like value for money. <laughs> <laughs> oh, very good. Uh, I've exhausted just about every question. The, the one thing I wanted to talk about is this show, uh, Hit Me Baby One More Time. Mm -hmm. North American viewers won't know what we're talking about. And from what I understand, uh, you know, Greg was talking about heats. And mm -hmm. so what they would do is they pit uh, uh, an 80s, 90s band 
one up against the other. In the North American context, it might be the Go-Go's against the Bengals, mm -hmm. and then it might be Hollow Notes against whoever. Uh, and then people would phone in and vote like America's Got Talent, and mm -hmm. you'd move up and up and up. And, and Hue and Cry made it all the way to the final, Mm -hmm. only to lose out to a Welsh Elvis wannabe yeah. by the name of Shaken Stevens. Exactly. Oh. Yeah, but he's some, mm. uh, some great uh, songs, Shaken Stevens. Oh, yes, Christmas, I agree, yeah. The Christmas song that he's got, um, The Snow is Falling All Around. Merry oh, Christmas, Merry everyone. Christmas, everyone, yeah. That's a fabulous song. I mean, really, yeah. the people that he had behind him. But he's, I mean, if you Google Shaken Stevens and look at his discog, Jeez, man, he wasn't quite Elvis, but he wasn't a like, kicking the butt away from it. He made he does make quite a catalog yeah. of such huge records, and you know people missed Elvis. A lot of these Elvis impersonators. There was a lot of them in the UK. There was Alvin Stardust. There was um, Shaken Stevens. There was another couple of guys. Uh, Cliff Richard was an Elvis impersonator. If you want to get very basic about it. But because he never came here and he's such a huge fan base here, Elvis, a lot of these Elvis impersonators were very popular because people could get their fix. You know, a lot of the, I mean, what's very popular over here is the tribute bands because a lot of the bigger bands don't come here that often. And then, and not so much Glasgow, but in the outer reaches of, of Scotland, these tribute bands are huge because people can get their fix on the bands that they love. So, I mean, Elvis impersonators, it wasn't surprising that there were massive acts in the UK around about the mid to late 70s, you know, early 80s, because Elvis didn't come here. One thing I wanted to ask that we haven't asked uh, any musician that we've had on before, like our big question, what is one of your favorite songs of all time? And also, what is your favorite uh, Hue and Cry album? Hmm. My favorite song of all time um, one that I would reach for, the Desert Island Disc, is uh, Harvest for the World by the Isley Brothers. I was a huge Isley Brothers fan. I loved how they made their music. I was a big Temptations fan. Um, you know, I could I could list a handful of Temptations songs that I would reach for as well. But I think all be said, Harvest for the World by the Isley Brothers is my go. That's the, my number one favorite record. It's got everything for me, uh, lyrically, melodically, groove, soul. It's got everything there. For me, um, favorite Hue and Cry album. Oh, there's so many. Um, we play what we on this record that we're just finishing off just now will be our fifteenth studio album, which is quite a lot. So um, there's some obscure ones we we signed to. There's a a, a hi-fi company in Scotland called Lin Hi-Fi L I N N, and they're really high end. So their their CD players are like twelve thousand dollars. The speakers start at about ten thousand dollars. It's solely for the Russian Asian market because nobody's going to spend that money over here. And those, but they're very high end. And to promote their hi-fi, they've got Lynn Records. And the first record they released in Lynn Records was the Blue Niles Walk Across the Rooftops, and that record was designed to show off the hi-fis. So from the success of that, they started making more recordings. But the kind of people that are buying these hi-fis wanted more classical and jazz recordings because they're more hi-fi sounding. So the Lynn Records jazz label became a big thing. And in the mid nineties, they approached us and said, would we make two records for them? And we were so honored that a, a company like this that had made such high-end audiophile records had approached us. And we did an album called Jazz Not Jazz. We did an album called Next Move. Now, Jazz Not Jazz has got the Brecker Brothers on it. It's got uh, Danny Gottlieb, drummer on it. It's got, you know, it's quite some of the greatest jazz musicians that have ever walked to earth are on that record. But it was our attempt to play more jazz pop rather than pop jazz. And the Sunday Times called it the greatest collaboration between pop and jazz since Steely Dan's Asia. Wow. It was That's complete praise. So if you look for Jazz Not Jazz by Hugh and Cry, you can have a listen to it. Um, we played it live because it was a jazz record, but it's all pop arrangements. Um, so uh, if I reach for Hugh and Cry and I'm in a, a kind of mood where I want to close the curtains and turn the hi-fi up, that's the one I'll reach for. And where can everyone get that album at? You're just going to, because um, this is a really high-end um, record company, they have their own streaming 
service. Oh, okay. And they only stream at 192K, 24 bit. They won't stream an MP3. Okay. So if you do jazz, not jazz, you and cry, it'll lead you to their site. It's not any more expensive than buying an album, but I think you need to download some proprietary software. I mean, they're that high end. I mean, we, we tried to kind of not buy it off them, but license it from them so we could sell these records. But no, they were even CDs a wee bit too low fi for them. Oh wow! It's just, it's just their thing. Um, I've got copies of it here, obviously. So those are the ones that I deal with. But if you Google uh, "jazz not jazz" by Hugh and Cry, you'll find your way onto the Lynn Hi Fi website, and from there you can navigate. You'll get it. It'll co probably cost you about twenty bucks to listen to it, but um, you'll be able to listen to it as much as you want. But yeah, that's a great yeah. record. And so if there are fans watching this who haven't uh, joined the Hue and Cry Music Club. You just get it through uh, the Facebook. You go to hueandcry.co.uk. You'll see all the social media links. Pat and I are very active on our Facebook page. That seems to be the page where people want to go to. Um, <laughs> our poor record company have been trying to steer us towards TikTok. But I had a look at TikTok and I don't, I don't even know what I would do on that thing. Uh, so basically the Hue and Cry .co.uk and then from there just go to the Facebook Facebook page and Pat and I are there after every gig hanging with the fans for an hour or maybe about two or three times a week I'll go on for an hour or so and answer some questions and start conversations with people and um, we monitor it uh, very frequently so you'll get to us with whatever you want request or questions just go there. Well that's awesome mm. well Greg uh this was an absolute thrill, a joy, you, and I would encourage anyone you know who's watching, like our videos, subscribe, check back through our our catalog of previous Mark 2.0 podcasts. You'll see other musicians like Owen Paul, uh, Chesney Hawks, Charlene, Taco, you, yeah, Taco, you name it. <laughs> Yeah, um, and, and, and make sure we're going to post uh, Hue and Cry's uh, website. Make sure to uh, check out their music. I, it's beside me that Hue and Cry was not more popular in the U.S. and uh, Canada. Don't you think, Gordon? It, you know, the music industry is so hyper competitive. Mm -hmm. And I know in Canada, uh, our music industry was very protective. We had what is called the CRTC and radio stations back in the 80s and 90s were mandated to play at least 50%, 5-0 Canadian content, which is what, without those rules, would we have Brian Adams? Would we have uh, Glass Tiger? Would we have these bands? And Scotland's the same way. Scotland's are, you know, the Scots are fiercely proud people. They want, I, I don't even want to hear that. That's from Great Britain. I want to hear something from Scotland. Give me some hue and cry. I can hear them well, saying it right now in the pubs. We do so. okay. I mean, I'm very... Uh, can, Canada also did a thing where the government invested in the bands yeah. as well for a return. So, I mean, that's where um, Alan set came from. That's where... Who were the rock guys? Who were the big Canadian rock band? Lover Boy. Uh, Rush. Rush. More, more the Rush. Who. Not Nickelback. Was Nickelback? Nickelback is from Sudbury, Ontario. Mm, yeah. Well, they, they got the investment from the government, and when yeah. they earn, when they reach a certain threshold of earnings, the government gets a kickback. And I've I've tried to convince a lot of the creative arts entities in Scotland to use that as a model. I mean, the Canadian government used it because they had vast distances to go to do tours, so it was to supplement the cost of you know tr going these vast distances. But I think as a model of investing in music for a return saying if you hit a certain threshold and you submit your accounts, we get a cut of that. And it doesn't need to be a big cut, but it's enough for you. Bands like Nickelback, Lance Morissette, that's a big, that's a lot of money, even if it is a small cut. So, I mean, I'm trying to encourage the Scottish arts entities to get involved in something like that. But I'd like to know how the Canadian authorities and ministries did it, because I think it's a great idea. Yeah, Not so much. The thing about only playing 50%, the French do that as well. Um, it was muted here in Scotland, but... At, mm, I'm not sure about that. I'm not sure. You kind of should get there by your own merit. Well, thanks so much. We really appreciate it. I've enjoyed that. I've probably talked too much, but thank you. No, guys. we loved it. Uh, I, I, 